Gaming has been part of the American fabric uh, since before the pilgrims. Of course, Native Americans had games before any white men arrived on the continent. Uh, and the pilgrims had gambling because in, in uh, 1622 they were passing legislation saying you can't gamble on Sunday, you can't play cards. They must have had gambling. And then Jamestown Colony, uh, they were established uh, in, in 1607. They were going broke. So in 1612 they got the Parliament of England to authorize a lottery in London to support the Virginia colony. We've had gambling right from the beginning. First racehorses came in 1620, first oval track, 1665. We had lotteries from the 1600s, uh, and then other kinds of card games. Now, it's su suggested the first casino was in New Orleans uh, in uh, 1820s, but then as the river boats went up and down the river, they were gambling casinos, and then the western mining camps. And so gambling's been part of the fabric, and we had hundreds of lotteries, and then there was elements of corruption, and then they would be shut down, and, and during the Civil War, most gambling was over. Horse racing ended because the horses were needed for the war. But after the war, lotteries began again, horse racing. And then again, there was the prohibition movement, and it also spread the gambling. And uh, Nevada closed casinos in 1910. And there was just sort of a couple uh, decades, 1910 to about 1930, when there were only a few horse racing places in the United States. No outward gambling, but underneath there was always private gambling going on. And then 1931, Nevada says, we're broke, we need some money. We've got all this underground gambling, let's just make it legal, we can get some taxes off it. Not even thinking that it could be the spark for the development of the greatest tourism industry in the world, which is Las Vegas with 37 million visitors a year uh, coming and spending all sorts of money on all sorts of activities. But that's how it started. It was a depression era thing. Horse racing came back in a big way in the depression. 1963, <clears throat> In, ni <clears throat> uh, in 1963, New Hampshire authorized the first lottery uh, of, the, of the century, and uh, it was followed by New York, and then New Jersey merchandised the lottery, and pretty soon it spread across the country. Now something like 40 states and District of Columbia have lotteries. Uh, and we were back in business. Uh, Bingos were authorized uh, all throughout, charity gambling spread. And then uh, there was a spark in the later 1980s for a spread of casino gambling. And the spark included the idea, it didn't have to be Vegas, it could be on a riverboat, Mark Twain rides, it could be $5 bets. And at the same time, a series of co federal court cases opened the door for Native American casinos. The cases were very simple. Now, we had charity gambling, we had lotteries, we had horse racing all around the country. And Indians wanted bingo games, as other people had them, but they thought, well, my goodness, we're out in the boondocks. There was one tribe that was 25 miles north of Miami. All the churches in Miami, they have an advantage over us because the people live in Miami. And they said, what can we do? And someone said, well, why don't we raise the prize limit? Ah, but the state has a $100 prize limit. Oh, to heck with the state. We're going to stay open 24 hours and raise the prize to $1,000. The sheriff protested, and this began the court cases leading up to the Cabazon decision. There were several California, Barona decision in California. Cabazon is a California tribe. But the, the line of decisions resolved, uh, went around this point, focused on this point. Uh, what can the state stop on an Indian tribe? The court concluded a state could impose its criminal laws on activity on an Indian tribe, on Indian land. They could impose their criminal law, but they could not impose their regulations and their civil law. In other words, if it was against the law, and the court said it had to be against the law for everybody, it could be prohibited. If it was legal, the states had to allow the Native Americans to participate in the activity, but the state could not regulate it. 
they couldn't impose civil regulation. So the, the tribe won their point that they could have bingo games and they could offer a thousand dollar prize and pretty soon the prizes were ten thousand a hundred thousand and one tribe started a million dollar game they could be open 24 hours whereas the charities could only be off open three hours a week something like this so that was the spark and then the california tribe said wow we have these poker games over here maybe we can have card games and they they won their case and the card game and the bingo thing were sort of combined in the cabinet on case, which was a United States Supreme Court case in 1987. And when that came down, it was essentially saying, wow, the Indians can have casinos not regulated. The court did say any regulation would have to come out of Congress. So then in 1998, because of the push of the Nevada gaming industry and state attorney generals who wanted regulation. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was passed. The Indians could have casinos if that type of gaming was permitted in the state and the, it would be regulated in a, by compacts and agreements made between the state and the tribe. The tribe could sue the state if the state refused to negotiate. And this happened. And in many states, Minnesota, not Minnesota, but Wisconsin and Michigan, the state sued and they won. And boom, they got their casinos. New Mexico, so forth. Arizona, they sued. They got their casino. Then in 1996, as the uh, Seminoles in Florida were suing the state of Florida for casino gaming, the state said, no, you can't sue us. And they, they said, why? Because the 11th Amendment says a state can't be sued in federal courts by uh, an equal entity or, or by a subordinate entity. And the Supreme Court said, yes, that's right. The tribes cannot sue the states. So where were the tribes left? It's a funny part of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. It says that uh, the state cannot tax Indian tribes. Well, after 1996, the, the tribes could no longer sue the states, and if tribe wanted a compact, the governor could just say no, a legislature would say no, and that's the end of it. Tribes approached state governments and said, uh, we know we can't sue you, but why don't we just sort of make an agreement if you let us have a casino, you, can, you, you can't tax us, but you can share our revenue with us. And you don't, you don't protest, and we won't protest. And so this revenue sharing, only about, I think, five, six, seven states have this. But this idea started, and California now has a revenue sharing agreement. And of course, Schwarzenegger's trying to up the ante. And Michigan, the casinos gave 10, they gave 10% as long as they had a monopoly. But when Detroit casinos opened, it was reduced to 2%. Wisconsin, they're negotiating the amounts up. Other states, New York's going to be 25%. Connecticut, uh, it's 25%. So uh, actually, Californians will be the largest because California, excuse me, New York and Connecticut, it's 25% of slot revenue. And Schwarzenegger has won some agreements, 25% of all revenues. So this will be the highest Indian gaming tax. It all violates the federal law. But who complains? There we are. There is a danger for California, though. If the tribes go down the Arnold Schwarzenegger route and they promise 25%, Someday in the future, some tribe's going to say, we can't afford it. Because, you know, actually, the tribes competing with Nevada, they're paying almost the same taxes. Nevada casinos have to pay federal taxes plus a state six and three quarters percent. And that comes out to be about that same 25 percent. They say, we can't compete. We're, we refuse to pay it. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to try to close them down. They're going to go to court. And some court's going to say, that 25 percent's out the window. It's violates the law, and it does. It's just a matter of who's going to go to court, when, and, and so forth. So anyway, the, the capsule of the, of the law is the door was open wide. It was shut a little bit with this seminal case saying the tribes can't sue the states, but that's when the tribes started playing cards with the states and saying, how much do you want? You know, raise, call, check. Let's, let's, let's play a poker game and get an agreement. And a lot of governors have been very happy to get agreements that will give the state a hundred million a year or so forth to, to solve budget problems. Arnold wants about a billion.